indwelling Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. John 14, 23 says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Now this seems very strange because Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 says there's only one Lord, one faith, one Spirit. So there's only one Spirit of God who is the Holy Spirit. One Lord, one faith, one Spirit, one God and Father above all, through a soul and in a soul. So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of our Father who is only one Spirit. John 14, 23 speaks of two manifestations of the one true God within New Testament believers. There is only one true God, our Heavenly Father, and one new manifestation of that God and Father who also became a man through the Hebrew virgin. In other words, there's only one Spirit of God. God is a Spirit, according to John 4, 23, 24, and they that worship Him, God, the Father, must worship Him in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks true worshipers to worship Him. So in John 4, 23, 24, we find that God is only one Spirit, and He's holy. He is the Holy Spirit. Yet that Holy Spirit of the Father descended upon the Hebrew virgin, according to Luke 1, 35, and therefore that holy child which was conceived in her, in the Hebrew virgin, was of the Holy Spirit and was called the Son of God. The title Son of God proves that God became a man through the Hebrew virgin in the incarnation. Not a single verse in the Bible ever says that there are two or three co-equally distinct God persons of a trinity. There's only one true God as our Heavenly Father. There's not... Three true God persons. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, because God became a man according to 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 2.5 says that there is only one God who is our heavenly Father, the only true God, John 17.3, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Hence, the scriptures speak of two aspects of the Holy Spirit of the Father's existence after his incarnation through the Virgin. God the Father's Holy Spirit continued with all of his unchangeable attributes in the heavens while he simultaneously existed as a true man in the incarnation by becoming a human being in order to save us. After the man Christ Jesus ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things, the human spirit of the risen Christ is now able to fill New Testament believers with the new human aspect of the Holy Spirit's existence as a true man who makes intercession within the saints as the indwelling Holy Spirit of the Father. Romans 8, 26, 27 clearly says that the Spirit makes intercession for the saints with groanings which cannot be uttered. But Romans 8.34 says it is Christ who is making intercession for us. And again in Romans 8.9 says, But you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So the Spirit of Christ is the indwelling Spirit of God who makes intercession for us. Not God as God, but God who also became a man. This is precisely what Jesus meant when he said, we will come to him and make our abode in him in John 14, 23. For the one Holy Spirit of the Heavenly Father simultaneously existed as both the Father, God as God outside the Incarnation, and the Son, God as man inside the Incarnation, after God became a man through the Hebrew Virgin. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 proves that there is only one divine Spirit as one Lord, and as one God and Father. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So the one Spirit of the one Lord is that Spirit of the one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Only oneness theology 
can adequately explain how the one Holy Spirit of God can simultaneously exist as both the Father and the Son. Because there's only one true God, the Father, who also became a human son. There are two distinctions of the Holy Spirit revealed in Scripture. The omnipresent Holy Spirit of the only true God, the Father, always remained the same unchangeable divine spirit outside of his incarnation in Christ Jesus. While a portion of the same Holy Spirit of the Father, our Heavenly Father, also became the man Christ Jesus inside the incarnation, which is a very clear, according to Matthew 1.20, that child which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, Luke 135, shall come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for this reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. The Son is called the Son of God because of the Holy Spirit overshadowing the Virgin to perform the act of the Incarnation. Likewise, Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus is the reflected brightness of His, the Father's glory, and the express image of His person. Jesus is the express image of the Father's person as a fully complete human person. God manifests the flesh justified in the Spirit. Hebrews 2.14 clearly says that the He who partook of flesh and blood, according to verse 17, was made fully human in every way. So when God partook of flesh and blood to become a man, he was made fully human in every way, which enabled him to pray and be tempted just like any other human being. One of theologian Robert Sabin described two distinctions of the Holy Spirit in his article, A Oneness Perspective of John 16:13. When the words Holy Spirit occur in the New Testament referring to the times after the ascension, exaltation, and glorification of Jesus Christ, the words Holy Spirit may refer to the Spirit of the Creator as our Heavenly Father, acting and moving, or the words Holy Spirit may refer to the glorified Son of God acting in His human capacity. Now, this is very deep to comprehend. The one Holy Spirit of the only true God, the Father, uh, is sometimes spoken of as the Holy Spirit of the Father outside the Incarnation, while the Holy, same Holy Spirit of God is also spoken of as the Spirit, the same Spirit who became the Spirit, the human Spirit of the Son in the Incarnation, acting in His human capacity as the indwelling Spirit of God. The scriptural evidence proves that the title Holy Spirit is sometimes used to describe the omnipresent Spirit of our Heavenly Father acting and moving upon Christ and His disciples, and at other times the title Holy Spirit is used after the ascension of Christ to describe the same divine Holy Spirit of the Father who also became the man Christ Jesus in the Incarnation. Ephesians 4.10 says, that the spirit of the risen Christ has ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So when the body of Christ was dead outside the city of Jerusalem in the tomb for three days, three nights, the human spirit of Christ descended into the lower part of Hades, took the keys of death and hell, resurrected his own body, and then ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. God as God has always filled all things. But when God became a man, the new existence, God's new existence as a son, did not fill all things as a son. He filled all things as the Holy Spirit of the only true God the Father, but he did not fill all things as the Spirit of the risen Christ. The human Spirit of Christ was newly formed in the Hebrew Virgin because God became a true man. God wasn't just manifest in the flesh as just the Spirit of God manifest in the flesh. No, when God was manifest in the flesh, God became a true man, according to Hebrews 2, 17. He was made like unto his brethren. The Greek text means he was made exactly like his brethren, fully human in every way, according to NIV. The same omnipresent Holy Spirit of God who became a man in the Incarnation also returned back into heaven to become a life-giving spirit, according to 1 Corinthians 15.45, as the omnipresent spirit of God. 
with the added human capacity to intercede and advocate for humanity. God as God cannot intercede to God. The Holy Spirit as an alleged pre-incarnate God, the Holy Spirit person, cannot pray or intercede to God. But when God became a man, God took the spirit of the risen Christ and made him a life-giving spirit. And then Galatians 4, 6 says that God has has poured out the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So the spirit of the risen Christ now fills all things in order to inhabit New Testament believers to give us the ability to pray and intercede through Jesus Christ in us, interceding to the Father. Wherefore, the miraculous nature of our omnipresent Heavenly Father enabled him to enter into his creation as a true man, a true human being, as his own arm revealed, the arm of Yahweh himself revealed, while retaining all of his divine attributes in the heavens. Hence, a portion of the Father's own omnipresent Holy Spirit was reproduced in order to become the man Christ Jesus, in order to save us, while the same omnipresent Holy Spirit of the Father could lead and empower the newly formed man Christ Jesus. This explains how the Holy Spirit could remain omnipresent in the heavens as the Father, while he entered into a new existence as the Son, as a man. The Son is the man. The Son of God, Son of Man, is our titles for the man Christ Jesus, for the God who became the man in the Incarnation to become our Savior, our Mediator, our Advocate, Helper, and Intercessor. God as God is not our Mediator, our Advocate, Helper, Intercessor, because God as God cannot mediate, advocate, or intercede for anyone. So there's two facts of Scripture that cannot be denied. Fact one is, the Holy Spirit of the Father also became the man Christ Jesus in the Incarnation through the Virgin Mary. Luke 135 says, The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, for that reason, because the Holy Spirit came over the Virgin Mary to supernaturally conceive the Christ child, for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. The Son of God is called the Son of God because of the incarnation to the Hebrew Virgin. The Son of God was not always a God, the Son of God, or a God, the Son of Man, because the Son of God, Son of Man are titles for the incarnation, for God becoming a man. So for what reason is Jesus called the Son of God in the first place? The Son was clearly called the Son of God because the Holy Spirit came over the Virgin Mary to supernaturally conceive the Christ child. Since the Son is called the Son because of his virgin conception and birth, Jesus could not have actually existed as a son before the Holy Spirit performed the act of the Incarnation. Hence, there is no eternal, timeless God the Son. There is a timeless God the Father. There is a timeless Holy Spirit of the only true God the Father. But there is not a timeless God the Son of God. That doesn't make any sense. Because the Son of God is the man who was born at Bethlehem. Matthew 1.20 says, But when he had considered this, behold... An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The Christ child was not conceived of Joseph or of some other man, but of the Holy Spirit of God, thus proving that the divinity of Jesus is of the Holy Spirit of the only true God, the Father himself. Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus is the brightness of his glory. So the Son is the brightness of his, the Father's glory, and the express image of his, the Father's person. The man Christ Jesus is clearly the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of the Father's person as a fully complete human person via the Holy Spirit of God reproducing himself as a man-child from the Father's own substance of being within the Virgin. We find that the Holy Spirit overshadowed the Virgin Mary in Luke 135, Matthew 1, 
20 says that the Holy Spirit supernaturally conceived the Christ child because that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit who is called the Father in Hebrews 1, 3, who is the brightness of his, the Father's glory, and the express image of his, the Father's person. So the Holy Spirit was the person, the divine person that overshadowed the virgin. And so Jesus is the express image of the Holy Spirit as the Father's person. That makes the Holy Spirit the Spirit of the Father. The man Christ Jesus is clearly the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of the Father's person as a fully complete human person via the Holy Spirit reproducing a man-child from the Father's substance of being within the Hebrew virgin. Prominent oneness theologians believe that God became a true man in the incarnation with an authentic human life. In other words, God became a man with an authentic human life. He wasn't just God manifest in the flesh as God. No, when God incarnated himself through the Virgin Mary, he became a true man with an authentic human life. At 23 minutes and 45 seconds into the oneness theologian David K. Bernard's debate with Trinitarian theologian Robert Morey, David Bernard said, and I quote, when we speak of Jesus conversing with the Father, it is understandable that Jesus was speaking as an authentic human being. Jesus was not speaking as God. He was speaking as an authentic human being. At 24 minutes and 30 seconds into the debate, David Bernard said, You must understand that it was a real human being that he submitted his will to God. So it was as a real human being, Jesus submitted his will, a human will, to his God. Therefore, the oneness position does not deny the fact that the Holy Spirit of the Father descended upon the Virgin to become a real and authentic human being with a real human life within the Virgin. God the Father was able to operate as the unchangeable God outside of the Incarnation, with only one divine will, while the child born and son given is God the Father with us as an authentic human being with a genuine will who prayed in the context of a real human life. Thus we have one divine person as the Father who also became an authentic human being as a human person. That is one God person and one man person, because God's person, his divinity, also became a true man person in the incarnation, just as the scriptures say in Hebrews 1.3 and in 1 Timothy 2.5. One of theologian Jason Dooley wrote in his article on Christology, and I quote, Once God assumed humanity at his conception in Mary's womb, he acquired an identity he would retain for the rest of eternity. Jesus' humanity is not something that can be discarded or dissolved back into the Godhead. But he will always and forever exist in heaven as a glorified human, albeit God at the same time. His humanity is permanently incorporated into the Godhead. Godhead means divinity. His humanity is permanently incorporated into the divinity. God did not just live in flesh as a man, but the Word became flesh. God is now a man. This does not mean he no longer exists as the omnipresent spirit. But it does mean that he exists as a man is both authentic and permanent. In Christ, the Spirit of God was inextricably and in separately join with the humanity. When God incorporated his new humanity into his deity, via incarnation through the Virgin, he took the human aspect of his existence into his divine existence so that the Holy Spirit of the Father exists in two distinct ways. God as God remains unchangeable in his attributes as the Father, while God as a man has been incorporated into his deity as a distinct son. Now, I'm not saying that 
that the sun vanishes away and he's no longer the sun. No, the sun will always be the sun as Emmanuel, God with us as a true man because of his virgin conception and birth through Mary. Scriptural fact two proves that the Holy Spirit of the Father led the man Christ Jesus. So the Holy Spirit of the Father who became a man in the incarnation also simultaneously retained his existence as the unchangeable heavenly Father in heaven to lead the man Christ Jesus and empower the man Christ Jesus and do the miracles through him. Matthew 4.1 says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So, as a man, Jesus had to be led by the Spirit of God, just like any other man. Luke 4, one says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit into the wilderness. Like all true prophets, Jesus was so fully human that he was full of the Holy Spirit and led around by the Spirit of God, just like all the prophets. Thus proving that Jesus, as a child born and son given, was not God with us as God, but rather God with us as a true man who had the capacity to pray, to be led by God, and to be tempted by the devil. Matthew 12, 28 says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus was able to cast out demons by the Spirit of God, thus proving that the Holy Spirit of God not only filled and led him as a true man, but also did the mighty works in his ministry as a true man. Jesus clearly identified the Holy Spirit that led him, filled him, and did the mighty works in his ministry as our Heavenly Father himself when he said in John 14, 10, and I quote, The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. So Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, but Jesus said in John 14, 10, that that Holy Spirit that filled him, is the Father that dwells in me. He does the works. Matthew 12, 28 says that the Holy Spirit of God did the mighty works, but John 14, 10 says that the Spirit is the Father who dwelt in Jesus to do the mighty works. Let us now harmonize the scriptural data to identify who the Holy Spirit of God inside of Jesus really is. Luke 4 1 says that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 12 28 says that Jesus cast out demons by the Spirit of God. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and he cast out demons by that Spirit of God. He was full of the Holy Spirit in order to cast out demons. Yet John 14 10 says, The Father that dwells in me, he does the works. The Father that dwells in me, he does the works. So Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, and he cast out demons by that Spirit of God within him. Yet Jesus said that it was the Father who dwelt him that did the works. It was the Father who dwelt in him to do the works. So we can clearly see that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of our Heavenly Father, who did the mighty works in and through Jesus Christ. So who led Jesus Christ of Nazareth? The only scriptural answer is the Holy Spirit of our Heavenly Father. And who did the mighty works through Jesus? The Christ. The only scriptural answer is the Holy Spirit of the only true God, the Father. One as theologian Robert Sabin wrote, Does this mean that there are two persons in the believer? Again, the answer is no. Only one being inhabits the believer. That being is the glorified Christ. He is God, he is man. From Brother Robert Sabin's article entitled, A Oneness Perspective of John 16, 13. The scriptures prove that there are two manifestations of the Spirit of God's existence after the Incarnation. One as the unchangeable Holy Spirit of the Father, who did the mighty works through Jesus. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and did the works by that Father who dwelt in him and another as the portion of the Holy Spirit of God who also became a true man in the incarnation to the Virgin. The Holy Spirit came over the Virgin, 
the holy child which was conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Wherefore, Jesus was not just a mere man who was led and filled by the Holy Spirit of God. For on the one hand, the omnipresent Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father who continued to remain unchangeable in the heavens while filling Jesus, leading Jesus, and doing the mighty works in his ministry. On the other hand, the Holy Spirit is the same Spirit of God who descended upon the Virgin to perform the act of the Incarnation in order to become a true man. Hence, Jesus as a Son is the Father's Holy Spirit reproduced as a true man inside the Incarnation, while the same Holy Spirit retained His true identity as the Holy Spirit of the Father outside of the Incarnation as the unchangeable, omnipresent Spirit of the Father. This explains the twofold application of the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures that speak of the indwelling Holy Spirit as the Spirit of your Father, the Spirit of your Father who dwells in you, and the Scriptures that speak of the same Spirit of God as the Spirit of His Son in our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, as the same Divine Spirit, according to Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. One Lord, one faith, one Spirit, one God and Father above all, through all, and in all. Matthew 10, 19 and 20 says, Jesus speaking, But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say. For it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speaks, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. So we have the indwelling Spirit, one Lord, one faith, one Spirit, one God and Father above all, through all, and in us all. That indwelling Spirit is called the Spirit of our Father. But we turn to Luke 12, verses 11 and 12. Jesus said, When they bring you over before the synagogues, we find in Matthew 10, 19, when they hand you over, meaning to the synagogue or, or to the rulers, the same passage. It's, the same, it's two different passages with the same meaning. When they bring you over, or when they hand you over to the rulers or the magistrates or synagogues or the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense. Or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour. Notice, in that very hour. We find in Matthew 10, 19, Jesus said, Do not worry about what you are to speak, but in that hour. For it will be given you in that hour, verse 19, what you are to say. But in Luke 12, 11 through 12, it says, Do not worry about what you are to speak in your defense what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you are to say. So here we find that the Spirit of your Father is the one speaking in you, but in a parallel passage, Jesus said, it is the Holy Spirit that's speaking to you through you in that very hour. So we find here clear evidence that the Spirit of your Father is the Holy Spirit that will speak through you by giving you the words to speak when you are brought before rulers and magistrates in that very hour. I challenge everyone to meditate on these scriptures and you'll see what I'm saying. Luke 21, 12 goes on to state that Jesus Christ is the indwelling spirit. They will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you into the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. Again, the same parallel type passage. When you're brought before rulers, when you're brought before the leaders or synagogues, when they deliver you and when they persecute you, they deliver you to the synagogues and the prisons, to the magistrates and to the, the secular rulers, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony so make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you utterance and wisdom. Notice, Jesus said, I will give you utterance and wisdom. How could Jesus be just a man like Socinians are teaching? Like 21st century uh, Reformation's teaching, like Anthony Buzzard. They're saying that Jesus is just a man. That's impossible because it says... I will give you the utterance and wisdom, which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. So here we find that is it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. Christ in you is the one living in us, 
who will give us the words to speak when we're brought before rulers and magistrates. So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father who also became the Spirit of the Son of God in our hearts who can intercede to God. Notice that all three parallel passages of Scripture say that the indwelling Spirit will give New Testament believers the words to speak at a specific hour when being delivered up before rulers and magistrates. Matthew 10, 19 and 20 says the indwelling Spirit is your Father speaking in you. Luke 12, 11 through 12 says the indwelling Holy Spirit will speak and teach you what to say. And in Luke 21, 12, Jesus said, I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. All three parallel passages are similar except that the indwelling Holy Spirit is described as the same Spirit of the Father and the Son. Here the oneness modalistic understanding best fits the scriptural evidence. For Arians and Socinians cannot explain how the indwelling omnipresent spirit can be Jesus Christ. While Trinitarians cannot explain how the Father, Holy Spirit, and Christ Jesus can speak as the same divine person. One of theologian Robert Sabin wrote, He who was with them would be in them. He who lived in the fleshly body would live as a quickening or life-giving spirit. He who was living in space would live omnipresently, filling the heavens and the earth. And yet, he would retain his identity and his prerogatives as a man. From Robert Sabin's article, A Oneness Perspective of John 16, 13. Just as 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, There is one God who was our Heavenly Father, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, so we have two distinct manifestations of the indwelling Holy Spirit. One as the immutable Holy Spirit of the Father, God is God who does not change, and the other as the same Holy Spirit who also became the Son of God, Son of Man, God is a man, by the Holy Spirit reproducing himself as a true man. Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory and the reproduced express image of his person as the image of the invisible God, the image of the invisible Father. For God's Holy Spirit united himself with humanity to become a child born and son given through his virgin conception within Mary. Isaiah 9, 6 says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Eternal Father. Everlasting Father. So Jesus, as a child born and son given, has the name of his Father. He is the mighty God, eternal Father, because his true identity is Emmanuel, God with us as a true man, according to Matthew 1, 23. Hence, the Holy Spirit is sometimes spoken of in Scripture as the Spirit of God the Father outside of the Incarnation, who led the man Christ Jesus. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit, performed the miracles on his behalf, and gave him the commandments to speak to his disciples. And at other times the scriptures speak of the same Holy Spirit as the same Spirit of God the Father, who also became a man inside the Incarnation through the Hebrew Virgin. That is why Jesus could say, I will give you utterance and wisdom as the indwelling Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 26-27 informs us that the indwelling Holy Spirit has the human capacity to intercede for the saints to God. And I quote Romans 8, 26, 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself, notice, the verse says we don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes, or the Spirit prays. Interceding is praying. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. But Romans 8.34 goes on to inform us that it is Christ Jesus who is the one who died. Who indeed is interceding to God for us. That is why Romans 8, 9, and 10 says, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. 
Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Notice that the Spirit of God who dwells in you is that same Spirit of Christ in you, according to Romans 8, 9, and 10. But if Christ is in you, so it's clear that Christ lives in us. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, always bearing about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus Christ, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal bodies. So the life of Jesus is living in us because Christ is the Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Hebrews 7.24-25 clearly informs us that it is Jesus who always lives, intercede for God's people. And I quote, Because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So we find that Jesus Christ is the Spirit who is interceding to God. We don't have a, a non-incarnate God, the Holy Spirit, praying and interceding to God. We have the incarnate Holy Spirit who became the man Christ Jesus interceding to God. This explains why the Holy Spirit is sometimes called the Spirit of Christ and sometimes called the Spirit of the Father because there's only one divine individual as one divine person in the Godhead. The following quotes are from the late Oneness Pentecostal author and apologist Robert Sabin in his article entitled A Oneness Perspective of John 16.13. Robert Sabin wrote, and I quote, The words, for he shall not speak of himself, in John 16, 13, refer to the inhabiting spirit of the exalted Christ. Jesus continues to possess his human capacities, as well as his divine capacities, even while he inhabits believers. End quote. Robert Sabin continued in the same article, when the Spirit inhabits the believer as the indweller, inhabitor, the Spirit, according to John 14, 18, and many other texts, is the man, Jesus, glorified, made a quickening spirit and indwelling the believers. Jesus in the believer, therefore, speaks as he did while on earth. Only what the Divine Father reveals to the human Son that is only what he hears from the Father. Wherefore, the indwelling Spirit is the glorified man Christ Jesus, who was made a life-giving Spirit when he ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. Yet Ephesians 4, 4-6 through 6 says that the one Spirit is the Spirit of one Lord, who is the same Spirit of the Father. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Only oneness theology can adequately explain how the one Holy Spirit of God can simultaneously exist as both the Father and the Son. For more videos like this one, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit us on the web where we have free books and articles on these subjects at apostolicchristianfaith.com. God bless.